Um, we'll go ahead and get started here. So good afternoon again, everyone, and welcome to uh, Grameen Foundation's Share Your Knowledge and Skills with Farmers webinar. I'm Michael Pascual, uh, Grameen Foundation's Senior Recruiter for the Farmer to Farmer program here in the Philippines. Uh, so Grameen Foundation, uh, our mission is to enable the poor, especially women, uh, to end poverty and hunger. And our breakthroughs are in digital financial services, digital innovation for agriculture, and health financing and access. The goals for today's um, webinar is to, are to introduce uh, Grameen Foundation's initiatives in the Philippines with focus on the farmer to farmer capacity building of the, co of the coconut subsector program. And of course, uh, we uh, invite you to join our uh, growing number of, uh, growing network of uh, volunteer professionals providing technical expertise to smallholder farmers. Next slide, please. So Bankers Without Borders is our um, uh, online uh, platform that we use to engage uh, with, uh, with international and uh, local volunteers. So in 2008, uh, Grameen Foundation launched Bankers Without Borders or BWB to create an efficient operational framework to mobilize, engage and leverage the talent and skills of the private sector to help support both its own mission and the missions of other poverty focused social enterprises. We partnered with uh, Fortune 500 companies and individuals to source some of the world's top talent and brightest minds and strategically connect our volunteers with high potential social enterprises and nonprofits fighting global poverty to improve their scale, sustainability, and impact. Starting with just 100 volunteers at the time of our launch, today we have more than 23,000 business professionals, academics, and students from 170 countries who are ready to contribute their time, skills, and expertise to strengthen organizations fighting global poverty. This talent pool of volunteers who donate their time pro bono enable us to uh, provide top-notch consulting, coaching, and training services at a fraction of the market price. Since inception, uh, BWB has consulted on over 1,000 projects for 178 pro poor organizations in 39 countries, helping them increase their organizational capacity and transferring skills and knowledge to their workforces. BWB also continues to support direct, the direct needs of Grameen Foundation, working as a business partner to Grameen Foundation's programs, support functions, and leadership team. In July 2019, Grameen Foundation was granted the opportunity to implement the capacity building of the coconut subsector program through the USAID-funded John Oganowski and Doug Bruter Farmer-to-Farmer uh, -farmer program that promotes technical assistance in developing countries. The Farmer-to-Farmer -farmer capacity building of the coconut subsector, also known as F2F COCOS, is a volunteer technical assistance program aimed to increase the coconut se sector's productivity, profitability, and expand access to financial services. I'm here today with uh, Judith Anuleto. She's our country director for uh, Farmer to Farmer Copos, and she'll be presenting about the Farmer to Farmer program. If you have any questions, uh, please type them in the chat box and we'll be addressing them during the questions and answers portion of the webinar. Thank you again and welcome. And uh, Judith, you may take it away. Thank you so much, Michael, and welcome to our participants today. So I'm Judith Anuleto. I'm here currently in Bicol, <laughs> um, trying to, to, to navigate the challenges of electricity and Wi-Fi connections. But anyhow, I'm here today to share with you the exciting experiences here uh, in Grameen Foundation. So currently, I'm the country director of F2F COCOS. Um, and so we, I would like to share with you um, some of the background of the program. So this is a, a, a 35 year old um, program. So it started in 1985 uh, through the Agricultural Development and Trade Act Farm Bill in the US government. So this is known as John Okonowski and Doug Berwitter farmer to farmer program and is named for the congressman who introduced the legislation in Congress 
and also John Agonowski, a former farmer and airline pilot who perished during the U.S. September 11th terrorist attack. So F2F supports farmers in developing um, countries to improve livelihood and food security. What happens here is that U.S.-based volunteers are sent on technical assignments to provide hands-on training to communities and various types of organizations such as cooperatives, agribusinesses, microfinance, and educational institutions. As I've mentioned earlier, last year, the program celebrated its 35th of global implementation and looks forward to more years of service. And despite the pandemic, F2F finds way to do its mission of generating sustainable broad-based economic growth in the agriculture sector. So in the Philippines, we have focused on the coconut subsector, at least for now. In the past year, given the restrictions, um, what happened is that we were provided uh, the flexibility to engage not only U.S. volunteers, but also to partner them with local-based volunteers. So they are not necessarily U.S. citizens now. So anyone uh, who are in the area have the possibility to work together with the U.S.-based volunteer to, to each of the projects. Some of the technical assistance done and ongoing are on farm profiling, market research, business and strategic planning, product development, and also e-commerce. So this year, until early 2023, we are working to deliver these various um, technical assistance as much as possible. We have a cap of 64 volunteer assignments, but at this point, because of the pandemic, we're not sure really how much of this we are able to, to achieve. But we are working hard so that we won't uh, you know, waste this opportunity. We have partnered with organizations in Southern Tagalog, Bicol, Eastern Visayas, and parts of Mindanao. These are also coconut rich areas. So actual implementation depends on several factors, especially now during this pandemic. No? So the type of technical assistance are mainly requested by the host or beneficiary organization. So could it be provided by a completely remote volunteer or, or we have to use the paired setup? Also the host capacity to implement the project at this time. Do they have the key personnel available to focus on the project? We have heard many have already also cut down their number of staff, their personnel, or even reduced their salary. So this is really a very crucial question. Right. Travel restrictions in the area. Is it high risk, the area? Are we able to move there or go there or visit there in, in some at least packet of time when, when uh, field work is necessary? And lastly, telecom connectivity. How do we communicate during these times? Of course, we need to use the phone and also other virtual meeting platforms. Without this, I'm sorry, but at this time, uh, it's really impossible to implement this. So you might be wondering what expertise do F2F host organization uh, generally seek? So here's a list of project themes that we have encountered so far. Uh, given that F2F COCOS is a demand-based program, the beneficiary or host organization plays a role in the, identif in the identification of the consultancy project that we will implement. And from that point, we try to reach out to um, potential volunteers and finally um, prepare for the assignment. So I have listed here on the left side, you'll see agribusiness planning. The, three, the, th the first three are basically on planning, no? so agribusiness, strategic and also operational planning sometimes, farm production planning. So evaluation of capacities and resources to market research, feasibility study, digital platform improvement, or even the creation of that or designing. Digital filing and storage. This is interesting. Um, but you know, many of our uh, beneficiary organizations have been left behind. So I mean, they're still on that, on that um, face that every time they have received documents, they will automatically print that and, and file that in the steel cabinet and so on. So sometimes they have really um, mounds of paper in their office. But 
not because they don't want the, to do to transfer to digital, but sometimes they just don't have the time or maybe the guidance to do it. So in fact, we just finished one of these kind of assignments uh, recently. But then uh, the others are value chain evaluation, farmer profiling and database development. This is also very basic, but many of the organizations we have encountered really uh, do not have or cannot really um, use very relevant or useful information or to base their programs and also their decisions. Capacity building program, finance and accounting efficiency, loan repayment, financial risk evaluation, and also gender inclusion in value chain. So if you notice, I think these are all on the management side now. If I go here on the green, green box, so we have quality and food safety, product development, design of processing facility, procurement or logistics. So basically on the production side of the organization. So below e-commerce, marketing and promotion, market linkaging, uh, the promotion also of loan services. So, so far this, are those that we have encountered, but we expect more to have uh, similar themes in the near future. So what impact after presenting this list of uh, technical themes that normally uh, organizations ask, what impact do we expect to create in providing these technical services? So what's the use, Dima? How can this help them? So the Philippines is the second largest uh, producer of coconut products globally. But the coconut farmers are among the poorest in the country with around 60% living below the poverty line. And then 30% of farmlands are in regions that are home to the largest number of women poor. So as a contribution of our organization, also of this program, uh, we are uh, trying to contribute our share of attaining the following. So quality and actionable information support. So hopefully we could have better program designs or plans, efficient processes, high quality products, database decision making capacities. Also, of course, income diversification and market options. Resilience to disasters, access to appropriate financial services. Yeah. So I'll stop here and hope to answer uh, questions at the later part of this uh, session. Michael, I I'll give it back to you. Thank you, Judith, for, for sharing more about the Farmer to Farmer program. Uh, and we're, of course, eager to answer any questions you have. So at this point, we'd like to share just a brief uh, video uh, kind of uh, showcasing um, some of the activities we, uh, we do uh, during, the, uh, during the engagements. Judith for, for sharing that. So as you may have uh, noticed on the uh, on the uh, in the images of that uh, video, uh, um, the volunteers who were highlighted there were uh, from uh, foreigners or from uh, uh, the United States uh, through the through the USAID uh, program. So um, 
I think Judith uh, will probably mention this uh, early, uh, later on during the during the presentation. But uh, um, uh, traditionally, we we deploy U.S. based volunteers to the Philippines. Unfortunately, due to COVID nineteen, we're unable to deploy the U.S. volunteers here. But um, we are um, working with uh, local experts or counterparts. So here are just a couple of the um, local counterparts that we've uh, um, that have completed their. Or, uh, have completed their assignments or are currently uh, on assignment with us and uh, gives uh, they will give us uh, or they have given us uh, kind of their feedback on their experience. So the first here is uh, um, Josaica Bienvenido. She is a licensed agriculturist skilled in research and marketing and hails from Santo Tomas Laguna. Uh, together with the U.S. Uh, volunteer, her name is Nancy Wells, she provided the boots on the ground for the project uh, business planning for Alaminas Laguna Consumers Cooperative or ALACO. And uh, we asked her um, why she would recommend the F2F Cocos to other volunteers and, and why. And she says, yes, because by, by sharing what you know, uh, you can also learn something new, making friends, connecting with the community and providing you a sense of purpose. Actually, during my assignment in ALACO, it helped me to stay focused and not to be swayed from what's happening around the world. I mean, the pandemic makes everyone stressed. Volunteering in F2F Cocos is good for my mental and physical health since I can go out, visit the farms, and have a, and have a chat with the cooperative's members. The program can bring fun and fulfillment to your life and to others. So we appreciate she just finished her assignment uh, uh, a couple months ago, uh, and uh, we are uh, glad that she's still um, engaged with us and has com uh, been communicating with us still. And hopefully we can uh, tap her again for uh, potential assignments in the future. Uh, the next volunteer we'd like to quickly highlight is uh, Mark uh, Lagamilla. He is um, currently a senior audit consultant with a firm based in California. Uh, and he was uh, also a staff uh, accountant for Grameen Foundation International and is now pursuing his CPA license in the USA. He brings a wealth of experience and knowledge in finance, uh, accounting, and management. Mark is based in San Leandro, Nueve um, Isilla. So we asked him why he volunteered to uh, volunteer to help uh, farmer to farmer despite his very busy schedule. He said, I have always uh, been inspired by the organization's purpose of building a better working world as its core foundation. By partaking uh, to the farmer to farmer volunteer opportunity, I became, it be, I became instrumental to achieve uh, to the achievement of this purpose. It always gives me a sense of fulfillment whenever I see and do good things and contribute positive impacts. May it be small or big to the community that I am part of. So we are fortunate to have these great local volunteers and uh, we hope to be able to expand our network of local volunteers and uh, hopefully uh, some of you might be interested in exploring those options with us. Next slide, please. So uh, you might be wondering what is the process? What does the process look like for when you uh, engage with, uh, with farmer to farmer? So, uh, uh, so I'm the recruiter. So I typically um, uh, am the one that is sourcing and finding the, uh, the, the talent uh, for these specific roles. Um, uh, when we understand the needs of the host organizations, uh, we work together as a team with the host organization to develop a scope of work, and uh, we identify the specific needs and, uh, and, and uh, I guess, criteria that they're looking for for, for that particular assignment. So once we identify these uh, uh, individuals or candidates for this specific role, um, we um, continue, and, and they have been selected, so ultimately the U.S., or sorry, the um, the host organizations are the ones to, uh, to select who they would want to move forward with. Uh, and we begin onboarding. So onboarding uh, typically takes between one to three weeks. And uh, that, uh, that includes the submission of uh, certain requirements. So that includes uh, professional references, uh, physician's note and health certification among others. And uh, we also undergo a short self-paced training on gender inclusion. And then the, the second, uh, the next, uh, I guess, process uh, with, with our engagement is um, uh, the volunteer work. 
So after the onboarding process has been completed, um, we hold a kickoff meeting. This is where all parties involved who will be um, actively um, engaged in this uh, assignment will meet. Um, and uh, the volunteers will have a chance to meet the key personnel of the host organization. And we do kind of a work planning um, introductions uh, and work planning and, and uh, we kind of create a, uh, what do you call it, a, a tentative um, or working um, timeline of activities, which will serve as a guide through the entire um, uh, duration of the, of the engagement. Uh, the thing that uh, when when this is uh, when after the the um, uh, work planning is is um, the first meeting has been concluded, then we uh, try to identify a good working schedule. So typically we have um, coordination calls every. Um, uh, depending on the conversation and the uh, the availability of all parties, but the, typically we hold one uh, uh, coordination call per week uh, with the volunteers and the host organization to kind of make sure that we're on the right track uh, on on in terms of the progress. Um, during the engagement, we also um, the the local uh, expert, uh, the Philippine-based volunteer, will uh, it's required for at least one field uh, visit to the host uh, to the host site. So um, this will also include uh, at least one um, farmer to farmer uh, staff who will be assisting um, during the the, the field. Uh, visits. So we want to encourage that. Of course, we have we we have we are mindful of the uh, COVID nineteen restrictions. So. Uh, volunteers will be required to take uh, RT-PCR uh, before uh, going on the on the ground. And of course, we have to keep in mind the local restrictions depending on the location of the actual uh, assignment or the host organization. Uh, during the volunteer engagement, this is also an extra uh, bonus, I guess, is because, um, as we mentioned earlier, the uh, the local expert or the Philippine-based uh, volunteer will be working with an expert from the U.S. The uh, expert from the U.S. Uh, is usually a high caliber um, uh, volunteer. Uh, usually it's somebody that's either retired or uh, is a CEO or um, uh, holds a, a high leadership position in, in, in other uh, types of uh, businesses and organizations uh, based in the U.S. So they are, uh, sometimes that can be an added bonus for, for folks who are um, based in the Philippines, especially um, students or, or beginner, uh, I guess, volunteers in this program. So they can get kind of build a relationship with this U.S.-based expert and uh, kind of, you know, uh, build a network from there. And then uh, the next uh, the next arrow here is the post volunteer work. So uh, of course we we don't want to uh, uh, we don't want the volunteers or the host organizations to think that as soon as the assignment's done is uh, that the Grameen Foundation's done with them. No, we um, we want to continue the relationship with the host organization, and we also uh, continue to monitor uh, their progress. Uh, based on the recommendations that the volunteers provide to the host organization. And uh, of course, we encourage the volunteers to continue building that relationship and uh, um, uh, continue communication, uh, even beyond Grameen Foundation. So uh, in, in fact, uh, we've had a couple assignments that uh, have concluded uh, and uh, the volunteer and the host organizations are still in contact and, and shoot each other emails and have become friends also um, you know, on, on social media. So there, there are opportunities like that as well, but we encourage definitely those type of, uh, uh, um, I guess, relationships after uh, the assignment. So the, the momentum keeps going. Uh, and uh, and uh, the host organization appreciates that relationship as well. Uh, with the um, going back to the field, um, I guess the field work. So uh, farmer to farmer does the program does cover certain provisions. So this includes um, if you are going to the field, includes uh, transportation, accommodation, uh, meals, and uh, we also cover health insurance for uh, volunteers who go on the field. And uh, the, the program also covers uh, needed supplies. So any assignment related supplies that are needed, um, the program also covers as well as uh, um, data and uh, um, phone, uh, phone expenses. 
the thing that we want to note, of course, uh, is, is uh, that this is a um, completely voluntary um, engagement. So it's, uh, uh, it's not a paid engagement. So the program does not give honor, uh, honorarium or professional fee to volunteers. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So um, it's, been, uh, it's been quite a challenge, especially when the COVID-19 uh, pandemic started. Again, we traditionally engage US-based volunteers, but it's been quite a positive experience being able to uh, um, you know, build uh, re relationships also with uh, local um, uh, Philippine-based experts. And we're hoping that through this um, webinar and through this opportunity um, through um, uh, Asian Institute of Management uh, Career Fair uh, will be able to um, reach out to other potential volunteers as well. So, um, you know, it's it's a challenging time, uh, but we but the effort of the volunteers um, put into uh, helping communities despite the pandemic is inspiring, and we hope to continue making a positive uh, impact together. So, at this point, um, we will leave it open to uh, questions and answers. Uh, I'm sure that some, uh, some of you might uh, already have some questions, so please feel free to, I think there's only a few of us, so please feel free to, to ask them um, uh, here. Hi, Ms. Cindy, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I don't have question. <laughs> Oh, sure. No problem. Okay. I think uh, somebody else does have a question. Nico? Si Nico. Yeah. Sure, Hi, Mike. Um, actually, I, I'm not sure if I missed this uh, a while ago with your discussion, but um, during the entire uh, uh, volunteer program, um, is it possible for me to, to be uh, employed full-time while handling uh, all the deliverables for the volunteer program, or does it need me to to work full time for 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 the host organization and you know monitor everything? Yeah, thank you. That's, that's an excellent question. Thank you, uh, Nico, for for addressing that. Uh, yeah, um, each uh, each assignment is different, and uh, we want to reiterate that we're we're flexible. Of course, we want to mind that the uh, volunteers may already um, may have uh, uh, their own profession or have their own jobs and, of course, personal lives. Um, so. Uh, in terms of our commitment or, or time, it really depends, I guess, on the, 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 the conversation you have with the host organization and perhaps your counterpart in the U.S. Uh, typically, uh, we don't have a standard um, timeline. Um, traditionally, when we deploy U.S. volunteers to the Philippines, it's usually two weeks or 18 days, which includes travel time. But since uh, uh, most activities, a lot of activities will be held uh, remotely, um, and of course, uh, when the local volunteer will be going, going on the field, uh, um, we are are willing to work with with you on that schedule. So, in fact, uh, the the volunteers that we've engaged with, um, most of them have uh, a job. <laughs> most of them are currently um, hold their own businesses and, and um, hold their own. Um, you know, they have their own schedules. Uh, but we try to be as flexible as possible. At, of course, also the uh, the host organization as well. So um, it can be uh, it can be managed. It can it's it's very doable. Uh, and of course, we want to be mindful of your schedule, and uh, um, we try to work uh, around that as much as possible. So hopefully, that answers your question. I, I you. just would like to add a bit, mm -hmm. uh, uh, also for the benefit of others who may may have some doubts. No, uh, in all the assignments that we had, I think all of them are employed they were employed or maybe they had just some kind of uh, sh short period of vacation leave but practically they've been working uh, for example jazz who we have quoted um, her, her testimony later uh, earlier uh, she was working also for for a government agency and studying also for her master and also mark for example that we have mentioned also earlier he has many, not only maybe two or three engagements, but uh, he's working, he's studying, he's preparing for a board exam, you know. Um, so it's possible, you know. So we are really very respectful of the 
schedule of the volunteers and also of the host organization. So we are flexible. So that's that's uh, just I would like to share with you. Thank you. Yeah, that was a that was a great question. So thank you so much for that. Any other um, questions? Uh, there's there's a question that usually comes up, uh, um, and, and Judith, uh, if you can um, help answer this as well. How do you guarantee the safety of volunteers during the pandemic? Yeah, that's very timely. No? So first and foremost, uh, uh, it's not only the volunteers who go to the field, so also ourselves. So we really want to be sure that before embarking on the visit, we have done the proper evaluation of the area. We have phoned or talked with the host organization, how safe it is, are there cases in the area or, or, or their town or province, and then what are the restrictions, what are the documents that we need to prepare, and so on. And then, but of course, this comes after also evaluation, how important is the physical visit there? Because if it's something that can be done, you know, virtually, we, we opt for, for the virtual. Anyway, after the evaluation, we also uh, give this option to local volunteers to, um, to avail of the health insurance. We have a prepaid health insurance that they can, they can um, acquire uh, that will cover the travel, the, health, the emergency, and also COVID and so on. And then also before embarking on the trip, we require that the volunteer will undergo an RT-PCR uh, test and also coming back when, when coming back home. So these are all um, provided, uh, expenses are paid by, by the program. And of course, during the, the visit, um, we, we, we have to follow the protocol. We have a list of protocol that everybody must must um, follow also the host organization must follow social distancing um, you know to have the meeting in an external area and so on so we know the drill right these are the things that we remind also our host organization because you know sometimes we become lax also we are friends we're happy sometimes when we're happy we forget <laughs> the risks around us so yeah so we make sure and that these things are followed. followed. I hope that answers uh, that question. If in case I, I miss something, uh, please add, Michael. Thank you, Judith. I think that answers it pretty pretty well. Um, are there any other questions from, from the audience? And so uh, Ms. Cindy asked, how do we send in our application? Judith, do you want to take that or do you want me to take that? Oh, you can, you can answer it, Michael. Okay, thank you, Judith. So um, how do we, uh, how, how do volunteers, if they're interested, apply for uh, for um, a volunteer position? So um, there's two methods. Um, uh, you can apply directly through the Bankers Without Borders uh, website, uh, which we'll be sharing later for you to um, free the access. Um, uh, the, the link, we'll be sharing the link later. Otherwise, um, you um, can also contact me directly. Uh, uh, my email um, will be also provided uh, here, uh, but um, typically, uh, uh, usually through the Bankers Without Borders uh, website, or you can uh, shoot us, um, uh, you can visit us on Facebook as well, uh, and uh, uh, um, send us a message, or um, uh, uh, yeah, send us a message, or shoot us, just shoot us an email. I think email is probably the best uh, the best method um, uh, of, of uh, getting to us directly, uh, but uh, yeah, usually it's through Bankers Without Borders, uh, the website, and of course, um, our emails, which we'll be providing here in a little after a while. Just to add on that, Michael, I'd like to, to flag that we have two open uh, volunteer uh, projects now, right? We have the, we're looking for someone who could, I don't know, uh, please fill me in. I thought about the market research, but then I, I thought, I remember this is a U.S. volunteer work. Do we have any any active for 
uh, recruitment for local now? Yeah, uh, Judith, we are recruiting actually for uh, a market linkage uh, expert um, who will be, this will be a paired assignment. So we'll be working with uh, a US counterpart. Uh, basically um, it's with uh, um, a farming co-op based in Dolores Quezon. Uh, and they have very, uh, they have many uh, value added products, uh, jams um, uh, and other types of food, uh, food type material. And uh, they uh, will need an expert they need expert advice in terms of how to ac better access uh, the market. So anyone who has kind of back, uh, background in market research, um, uh, business development, uh, that, is, uh, that is an open opportunity that we hope to start um, soon. Um, we have another question uh, from uh, Ms. Jani. Uh, do you have available teaching materials or are there necessary skills and knowledge to be part of the program? Judith? Yeah, that, that's a nice question. No? So um, the, the projects are basically based on what the organization, beneficiary organization asks. So uh, for example, they would need some help on business planning. So there goes everything that is lumped there in on on about all about management. You you have to have that that skill. It's like a job when you search for a job. Only this this has a different setup because this is a volunteer uh, technical assistance program. But it's it's very it's very similar. So all the things that will be needed during the assignment from the uh, beneficiary organization side that will be provided. So also the volunteers will have time to prepare themselves. And even before that, during the recruitment, of course, we, we will, um, we will uh, give the necessary background because we start, of course, with the scope of work. So we have all the list of expectations that, that every applicant will, will need to know. So if you are asking about, about available teaching materials, we have, um, we can share with you or we can provide you the links to the experiences that the volunteers had previously. And then, you know, the, the scope of work will really be very helpful in this, um, in this project. I hope that answers the question. So I just would like to add, Bala. So basically, an assignment would start with the evaluation of the situation of the host organization. So depending on what is available, what information is available, um, it would it might require actual field survey or even only the the evaluation or work work uh, walk through to the processes of the organization, and then all the skills, all the knowledge of the volunteers will come in before um, providing the final recommendations. So that's how it's been. And I think it will always more or less be like this. It will only change on the degree and extent on depending on what is written in the scope of work. Normally, the scope of work, the deliverables are very simple, very straightforward. These are smallholder organizations um so we we do not expect really very you know very complex uh, assignments um given that this is also a volunteer work and what we normally do also if a, a horse organization has let's say a complex problem we try to you know to face the, those to divide those in several assignments so that also the volunteers can really focus on the meat of the assignment Thank you, Judith. Any other questions before we conclude? Hi, Michael. I just have one last question. Um, uh, I forgot your name, ma'am, but you've mentioned that uh, there is an assessment first of the situation within the host organization before we dig deep on the uh, on the formulation of all the and analysis of the problem. But is there a possibility that upon assessment we found a more pressing concern that needs to be addressed first rather than the initially identified problem or do we really have to stick with the 
with what's stated on the scope of work and there's no uh, room for you know adjustment and changes thank you yeah interesting question in fact it happened to us just recently <laughs> we we are flexible i think that's also one of the the reasons why farmer to farmer has has been running long for 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 so many years because of its flexibility there is room for adjustment we only have to justify that because uh in the scope of work just like any scope work now, we state the problem, we state the deliverables, uh, we provide suggestion modes of how to, to tackle the situation and so on. But yeah, you're right. Sometimes something happens along the way and you, you, you discuss this, you will discuss this with the host organization. Maybe you will have to move a little bit on that side or maybe retract a bit or maybe expand a bit. So this will go on with the discussion with the organization are you willing to do this now or do we just you know uh just say that this is what we found out so these are the recommendations and then we can design a different scope of work for that different uh um activity then so there is room for communication the example that i would like to share with you in fact is what we have with uh, an mfi that because the scope of work was prepared much early on before even the pandemic, of course, their perspective was a bit different. This, these are our plans. We would like to do this and so on. But then, boom, the, the COVID-19 pandemic came. So they also had to change um, their, their way of thinking, which are our priorities now. So in that case, in fact, we had, I think, three, let's say three or four deliverables, we had to, you know, to reduce it to make and take out one of the deliverables and state that, look, this is the situation. This is what happened. And so, uh, yeah, that, that's, that could happen. That's, <laughs> that's a reality on the ground. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. And, and, and Judith, I'm not sure if we, we touched uh, up on, on, on this, but uh, um, each of the host organizations are allowed up to three uh, three assignments. So um, we try to work with the host organization in the very beginning, kind of setting out like four priority type of, of assignments to focus on. Uh, but really, it depends um, on uh, the first, really the first rollout or the first assignment. Uh, after the first assignment, you really kind of gauge what what is really important, what is really um, would be the next uh, priority in terms of, uh, of uh, what the next assignment should should be. So. Um, we, I think Judith, Judith can, can attest to this too. We had a um, uh, assignment uh, with the uh, Friend Foundation, um, and that focused on kind of a micro enterprise, um, a transitioning micro enterprise uh, in its capacity building. But they decided to change course, uh, and the volunteer actually recommended to focus more kind of on the community uh, development. Um, so there are instances um, where, uh, where yeah, the 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 direction of the uh, assignments uh, will, will change course. So, okay. Any other questions? Uh, I, I just would like something to that. On the other side of that coin is the scope, uh, uh, scope creep. What we call it. I think you know what it is. You know, sometimes the objective is this one, and then little by little, every uh, now and then, maybe the host organization, oh, but probably that's not what we want, that's not what we need. So, sometimes we really also have to, you know, sit, sit, sit down again and you know, try to understand the situation because sometimes, even if you have three deliverables, sometimes they would ask for the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and so on <laughs> because you know. There is help coming. So maybe this person could provide us all the help that we need. But sometimes, you know, we hit, we have to prioritize the things. Before you go to step two, we need to, you know, focus on this first one first before we move to the next. Sometimes it happens. And we have encountered that too. So we, we go back to the scoop of work. We talk with the host organization. Also, of course, the, the, the volunteers, what they think about it. Because after all, it's the host organization also that uh, that ask for the for the help. So one way to go out of that is prepare another uh, engagement that could possibly address whatever they thought of 
at that moment. <laughs> so they say, oh, maybe we need another project. So there's a lot of, you know, discussions that come along during a sign Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that that also provides some insights, no? Some, some descriptions on how this assignment is going. Back thank you so much, you. Judith. So um, thank you everybody for, for taking the time to listen to us um, and uh, hopefully yeah, I gave you some, some um, valuable insight. Um, uh, and then we hope to continue um, you know, uh, the conversation with you. So I'd like to uh, first thank the Asian Institute of Management Career Services. Uh, hi, Mom Jade. <laughs> nice hi. To see you. Um, thank you so much for I'm for so glad you could make it. Yes, thank you, thank you, um, and we hope we're able to. Uh, you were able to gain some valuable uh, insight to our efforts through the Farmer to Farmer program, especially during yes. the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, so, for more information, um, you can reach us at uh, bankerswithoutborders.com slash volunteer. You can also shoot us an email at gf underscore f to f at grameenfoundation.org, and you can also visit us on Facebook by typing fb.com slash bwb. Uh, and uh, of course, I, I sent the, on the chat if you would like to, if you know anybody or uh, you're interested in, uh, uh, um, I guess, being part of our uh, network of, of uh, potential volunteers, you may also email at me at npasqual at grameenfoundation.org. So on behalf of uh, Farmer to Farmer Cocos, uh, thank you. And uh, we hope everyone has a safe uh, and a great rest of your day. Yes. Thank you if so much. Thank you too, Ms. Judith. So if there's any um, uh, follow-up questions after this session, uh, feel free to coordinate with CSO and we're happy to connect you back to Grameen Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jade. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.